Hey there, all you cool cats and kittens. Uh, welcome to week 11. So this is the video lecture for week 11. And next week will be the unit two exam. And so this does represent the last new material that you will have um, towards unit two. And uh, before we get into the notes, uh, again, I, I've mentioned we're having some renovations done around the house. And so it's a little loud and uh, the garage was the best place I could find to, it was kind of quiet. And so I brought the computer out here and I'm sure some of you are like, well, how come I don't see the Lambo out in the, one of the Lambos out in the um, parking lot? And I just, I don't want to make the other teachers, you know, jealous or feel bad. So um, I keep the Lambos and the Porsches at home. And so, um, but anyway, let's go ahead and get into the notes here. All right. It's good chemistry catch up, very punny. Um, but we are getting into something called intermolecular forces here. And before we can get into intermolecular forces, we need to make sure that you can identify polarity of molecules. And this was something that came up in the uh, kind of interactive uh, 10.5 assignment that you had where you got to play around with polarity of bonds and, and molecules. And so we'll be applying that for the first uh, part of this lecture. So as a quick review, um, we had talked about electronegativity early on and we'll continue to use that during this uh, lecture. Remember that the general trend is up towards fluorine. So fluorine is the most electronegative atom on the periodic table. And remember that electronegativity has to do with how much an atom can pull on electrons uh, within a bond. And so uh, fluorine being the most electronegative, and you'll notice that the metals generally don't have very high electronegativities. And that makes sense. Remember that metals are going to give up electrons to form cations. And then we presented you a general trend and kind of some numbers. And these numbers are not set in stone. But as I move down towards greater electronegativity difference, the bond becomes more ionic. So in general, if you have a small difference in electronegativity, those electrons are pretty much evenly being shared within that covalent bond. And um, we don't have unequal sharing where one of the atoms would have the electrons more often. Now, as we move to a greater difference here, we start to talk about a polar covalent bond, and we'll mention that a lot throughout this lecture. But the electrons are not being evenly or unevenly being shared. And so it's still a covalent bond. But within that sharing, one of the atoms, the one that is more electronegative, is going to hog the electrons, for lack of a better word. And so the electrons reside more uh, towards that atom within the bond. And then finally, at some point, the difference is so great in electronegativity that the electrons are actually just transferred and exchanged. So one of the atoms gains it, the nonmetal, and the metal will give it up. And this is an ionic bond at that point because the uh, difference is so great that we actually have a transfer. But remember that the covalent and polar covalent, they're sharing. It's just at, in terms of the polar covalent, it's unequal sharing. So for those of you who are more visual or just like weird cartoons, um, we've got this where in this nonpolar covalent, notice that they're both hydrogen. And so it, because there's no difference in electronegativity, these electrons are being shared equally. And so uh, we would expect those electrons to reside pretty much in the middle of the two for this covalent bond. Whereas down here, we have a polar covalent. And in this case, because chlorine is much more electronegative than hydrogen, uh, you'll notice that chlorine is kind of hogging the electrons. And this idea of uh, tug of war with the electrons is one that we're going to use often. Now, we try not to personify atoms. Um, and I feel bad for chlorine here because they're kind of person personifying chlorine as a jerk. And it's not chlorine's fault that it has a higher electro electronegativity. It just does. Um, but in this case, again, visually, you'll notice that the electrons reside closer to chlorine. And so this would uh, dictate a polar covalent bond. All right, so then we need to talk about a couple terms here. Um, the first one and, and important one we'll talk about throughout this lecture is dipoles. Now, dipoles are gonna occur in polar covalent bonds. So remember during just covalent bonds, um, completely equal sharing, but in a polar covalent bond, it's unequal sharing. And that is due to the electronegativity differences. And because of that difference and because the electrons reside closer to one of the atoms, um, than the other, and again, it's the more electronegative atom, then we get a, a 
partial charge. Now it's important that it's not a bond. This is not ionic bonding. It's still a covalent bond, but within that covalent bond, the sharing isn't quite equal and the electrons reside closer to one of the atoms, the more electronegative one, and you're gonna get a slight uh, region of negative charge near that. So in terms of what this looks like, we'll go again, look at this hydrogen versus chlorine bond. So this bond is polar because chlorine is more electronegative and we can use an arrow um, to show that. Now this year, we're not gonna have you worry about this. Um, this is called mapping dipoles and we don't need you to be able to do this. You'll never have to show this. But I am gonna use these arrows just because I think it, it helps to talk about the uh, polarity of a molecule. And so you'll notice that you have a slight negative region on chlorine because it is more electronegative. And so the, there's two electrons in this covalent bond, this single covalent bond, but chlorine is gonna hog them. So they're more often near chlorine and that gives us this negative charge. Whereas on this side, because the, uh, the electrons are not typically near the hydrogen because the chlorine is gonna hog them, we get a slight positive region. Again, these aren't bonds, these aren't official charges, it's just a, a region. And we can use this arrow to show that. So notice the positive side is uh, over here with hydrogen and we point towards the more negative region. And we talked about this before in terms of dipoles and we said that the earth is pretty much a dipole because whether we're talking geographic or magnetic, uh, we've got uh, kind of opposing regions of earth uh, uh, opposite each other. And that's really what's going on when we look at this uh, polar bond here. So this is a polar covalent bond. So then how do we take the idea of a bond being polar and apply it to an entire molecule? So I'm gonna show you these and, and before you pause and start writing this down, just realize this year, we're gonna really just kind of try to make it simple and we're not gonna worry about doing math with electronegativity differences or anything like that. Um, ultimately, when you're looking at a molecule, we're gonna have you look as to whether it is symmetrical and balanced or not. So that is one of the major things and that's number two here. Now, it matters if there's polar bonds or not, but you'll see with number one and number three, I think it's easier if I show that to you. And so that's why we're gonna focus on number two and number four. And I know that some of you like writing down kind of rules and guidelines and you're more than welcome to do this. But I think this year, because we are gonna to try to make it a little bit more straightforward, um, just two and four are the main things. So is it symmetrical and does it look balanced? And then the other really important thing that's gonna help you out a lot is if there are lone pairs on that central atom, then it's automatically polar. So that's actually, I know it's number four, but I would say the first thing you look at is is there a lone pair in the central atom? Because if there's a lone pair, it's polar and you don't have to go any further. If there isn't a lone pair, then you do need to look at, is it symmetrical or non-symmetrical? And again, you can think of it as balanced or imbalanced. And so we saw in that previous slide, the idea of a tug of war is gonna work really well as we try to figure out if molecules are polar or non-polar. So again, bonds are pretty easy to point out if, if it's polar or non-polar, but once that's all into a molecule, how do we figure out if the molecule as a whole is polar or nonpolar? Now, were we in class, I would have you pick a couple of these or maybe I'd assign to you and a partner to, to do the Lewis structures and figure out, um, would you predict these to be polar or nonpolar? And feel free if you want to um, you know, FaceTime with a friend and do some of these together. Maybe uh, your parents or guardians wanna get involved. Maybe you wanna go across the street to your neighbor and ask them if they want to do, actually don't do that. That'd be weird. But the idea is we, we can't really do this right now. Um, but this would be a good slide to come back to after the end of all of these notes uh, for this lecture and try some of these and see if you can get Lewis structure and then ultimately get to that molecule being polar or nonpolar. So for now, I'm put this up here because it, it, it is good practice. I'm just gonna go ahead and reveal answers. Um, but again, it's not a bad idea to come back to this if you wanna nerd it up a little bit. So instead of having you do this, I'm gonna just show you a few examples and I'm hoping that through those examples, this idea of whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar uh, makes sense. So let's go ahead and look at CH4 here. So this is methane. And um, remember the two main things we're looking to do here involve um, a lone pair on the central atom. And when you look at this central atom, there is not a lone pair, there are four bonds around it. 
remember in first year chemistry, there's only four possible domains anyway, and they're all filled with a bond. So lone pair is not there. And so we're thinking, okay, probably nonpolar, because if, if there was a lone pair, this would be polar. But we do then need to look at, is this symmetrical and is this balanced or not? And so when we just look at this, we have a carbon surrounded by four hydrogens, so that all looks symmetrical. And so again, we, we predict nonpolar with this symmetry, but also we could think about the arrows with electronegativity. Um, as I refer to my appendix here, which I always keep an appendix around. You never know, like sometimes I'll keep one under my pillow at night just because I, I wake up and I wonder what is the polarity or what is the electronegativity of carbon, it's 2.5. Um, and so that is uh, more electronegative than hydrogen. So if we think about the electrons within this bond, they're actually gonna be uh, hogged a little bit by carbon. Uh, but we also have the opposing happening here with this bond. And again, think about it this way, over here, this carbon or the carbon in the, in the middle is uh, gonna hog the electrons from the, the hydrogen in this bond, but we have that also happening here. So ultimately, if you kind of think about this as a tug of war, all of the pulling on the electrons is completely equal because it's all of these bonds are carbon and hydrogen. And so really, you can kind of think of this um, weird tug of war thing, which it took me a while to Google something like this, but it exists. Um, but if you assume that uh, each of these people have the exact same strength in terms of this tug of war, then there's this person pulling this direction is counteracted by this, and this direction is counteracted by this, and that's what's happening down here. And so, yes, we can look at that, no lone pairs, and it looks symmetrical, but also if you think through the electronegativity and polarity of the bonds, this is going to be non-polar. Um, but this idea of tug of war always works when we are applying the idea of whether a molecule is polar or not. Now, let's look at another example. So on this example, immediately you see a lone pair. And so immediately you're thinking this is polar and, and you're right, and you could be done right now. But again, if we, we wanna extend it just a little bit here, just to think through it. Um, when again, we look at our trusty appendix here, oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur. Um, and so that means that the electrons in this bond are being pulled this direction or un unequally shared in this direction towards oxygen. And same thing here. And so when you think overall, electrons being pulled this way and being pulled this way with nothing to counteract it up here, this is, this is definitely gonna be polar. So it's not symmetrical, it's not balanced. And again, the, the fact that there's a lone pair meant it was polar from the start. Um, and again, not the perfect representation of what's happening down here, but this is an unequal tug of war. And in this case, uh, just like in the, in the molecule down here, uh, because there's an imbalance and because it's not symmetric, um, you're gonna have a polar molecule. Now, just real quick, if we come back over to this side and look at the CH4, instead of having CH4, what if this hydrogen instead was a chlorine? Now, immediately again, when you look at this, there's no lone pair, but the chlorine doesn't really make this symmetrical anymore. You have hydrogen, 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 but then a chlorine that's not symmetrical or balanced. But also, again, if you kind of think about the electronegativity difference here, we know that carbon's more electronegative, electronegative. And same thing in this direction. So these kind of cancel out. Now carbon here in this direction, more electronegative, but chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. And so overall, we've got this pull of electrons towards chlorine, and that makes it not balanced, not symmetrical. Um, up here in this example, that'd be like, instead of having you know, this person, we bring in the world's strongest man who is going to pull the rest of these in that direction. Um, and again, not balanced. And this would then indicate if you have chlorine, that would then be a polar molecule. So let's look at just a couple of examples here real quick and I'll go, I'll go quicker. Um, remember looking for two things, lone pair on the central atom. In this case, I do not see lone pair in the central atom. The next thing we need to, to look at is, is this symmetric, is this balanced? So if you kind of think about cutting through the central atom here, um, this bond is polar. Oxygen is more electronegative, but we have the exact same bond on this side. And so ultimately, again, think tug of war, um, this polarity here and this polarity cancel out. So overall, this is a nonpolar 
molecule. Next, we can look at something like water and we have lone pairs. So immediately we're thinking polar, but also just if you're gonna map it out just a little bit, um, oxygen is more electronegative. So we have electrons being pulled from this bond in this direction. Then for this bond, they're being pulled up towards oxygen again. And so if you think about overall, you have electrons in this direction, electrons in this direction, and nothing to counteract it. So that imbalance tells you it's gonna be pol uh, polar, but also just the fact that there are lone pairs on the central atom makes this polar. Uh, we can look at this. So again, no lone pairs to help us out. But if we look at the symmetry of this, you've got hydrogen versus nitrogen, not symmetrical. So the identity of the atoms matter. And so ultimately we could immediately say that this is polar, but double check, remember that carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. And so we are gonna be pulled the electro, pulling the electrons towards carbon. And then nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. And so again, we're pulling even more in this direction. That is not symmetric. There's no canceling out of where the electrons are, are being pulled towards in terms of electronegativity. And so that just verifies that this is polar. And then finally, here, the bonds are all the same. So it's all bonds between carbon and oxygen. And again, these bonds are polar, but if you think about the directions that we are pulling in it, and no lone pair on the central atom, so that does not help us. But uh, as we look at the symmetry, you can pull this direction for the electrons, this direction, and this direction, because oxygen is more electronegative. And so if you isolate just the pull of the electrons, notice that again, think tug of war. If you're playing a tug of war game, where you're completely equal and opposite in terms of the ability to pull, then this is gonna be nonpolar. And again, the fact that there are not lone pairs in the central atom just helps to verify that. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's, as you get used to this, it's mostly common sense. Look for lone pairs if they're present on the central atom, central atom only, it's polar and then look at is it kind of equal and opposite in terms of the electronegativity and polarity of bonds or not. So look for symmetry. Okay, so I know that was really, really awesome and you learned a lot, but I think quick brain break here works. Um, I know that you probably none of you are on Facebook. I don't think anyone your age uses that anymore, um, but whatever it is, go on Instagram, go do some snaps or whatever it is, and uh, take just a quick break, not three hours, just Take a quick break and um, we'll come back for the second part of these notes. All right, welcome back. I hope you uh, found some good memes out there, although I think it's pronounced meme, I think is, is how it's pronounced. But um, here, speaking of uh, meme, rest in peace, Sean Connery. All right, so then the second part of these notes is actually taking this idea of polarity of molecules and apply it to the intermolecular forces. <clears throat> and so a couple of important definitions. So the first <clears throat> is intra. So remember the whole point of this is inter, but the intramolecular forces is what we've been talking about for weeks now when we talk about the bonds within a molecule. And so here we've got ionic and covalent and polar covalent as the examples, but this is what holds molecule, the intramolecular forces. Now what we're concerned about and why we talk about the molecule as a whole, whether it's polar or nonpolar, has to do with the interactions between molecules, which is intermolecular forces. So intra is the bonds. And I'm gonna give you a, a few examples of this because this is always a little bit confusing. Those terms are so close. And so um, we, we notice that students have a little bit of trouble with this. And so I'm gonna give you a few examples here, but intramolecular forces are the bonds whereas intermolecular forces are those interactions between molecules that arise because of the polarity of those molecules. So one way to maybe think about this is if you're um, thinking about the interstate, interstate highway system, like something like I-70 is interstate. And that's because it goes between states, just like intermolecular forces are between molecules. Um, an example of an intra, state highway might be something like Colfax, which is exclusive to Colorado. Um, and so again, that interstate, intermolecular idea is a cross in between states and molecules. So maybe that helps, maybe it doesn't. 
But again, um, one thing that we need to just remember overall, and I'm going to bring this up a couple of times, is that intermolecular forces, those attractions and interactions between molecules, are weaker than the actual bonds, the intramolecular forces that hold the molecules together in the first place. So ionic and covalent bonds are much stronger than the three types of intermolecular forces that I'm going to introduce to you in just a, a few minutes here. Visually, maybe one more way to talk about this is if you think about water. Um, we saw water earlier, so this is a polar covalent bond both here and here, and that is holding this molecule together. So that's much stronger, right? The interaction here, this polar covalent bond is much stronger than the slight attraction. And if you think back, we, we said that oxygen is more electronegative, so slight negative charge on oxygen and a slight positive charge on hydrogen. Again, these are not uh, bonds, these are intermolecular forces. So what we'll find is that uh, water molecules are slightly attracted to each other. Now again, they're held together very strongly by intrapolar covalent bonds, um, but because of that unequal sharing, we get this slight attraction, and that's where intermolecular forces come from. But again, it's much easier to break this bond in terms of the intermolecular force and I shouldn't say bond there, just that interaction, that intermolecular uh, attraction there, versus the actual bond that holds water together. Now, there's a, a pretty uh, specific connection to the, the states of matter. And I am assuming that you've had states of matter at some point in your science career. But um, this may be the first time that we talk about intermolecular forces as being a reason, or a large reason for those. And we used to make a much bigger deal about this, and this was a much bigger part of the test, and it's not anymore this year, at least. We're just, again, trying to scale things back. But I do want to mention it because it is such an important thing, and you'll, you'll see later in the third part of these notes that um, there's a lot of real-world application that can be applied for these intermolecular forces, and the states of matter have to do with it. So solids, um, in part with a solid, the intermolecular attractions are so strong that they really kind of lock together a solid and give us the properties that we would expect for a solid. Um, and there's just not enough kinetic energy with the temperature to break and overcome those intermolecular forces. And again, we're not talking about breaking bonds here. Now liquids, the intermolecular forces, are still strong enough. And, and the way I describe it is like in water, um, it's a liquid. When it's a liquid, there's intermolecular forces and it kind of causes those water molecules to stick together. And we'll talk about it later, but um, there's a lot of interesting things that come from this idea of intermolecular forces in water. But it's also still, there's still enough kinetic energy compared to a solid where they stick, but they don't stay like they would in a solid. So there's not much order to liquids. And, and again, you, you know that. Uh, now, if we add enough kinetic energy and we can overcome those intermolecular forces, then we get a gas. So completely overcome that. Um, and this is important with water. And I think what happens, if you think back to the previous slide, I think some students think that when you boil water, and we get this, like I know some of you may think this is silly, but when you boil water that you're just randomly getting um, from water, right? If you boil it, all of a sudden you're getting hydrogen, you're getting oxygen, right? those diatomic have no fear of ice cold beverage um, molecules, which is not what's actually happening. You're not giving enough energy by boiling water at, you know, whatever, 100 degrees Celsius. Um, that's not enough energy to break apart bonds, but it is enough energy to overcome the intermolecular forces that would typically keep water as a liquid. And so that's important to keep in mind as we move forward. Uh, again, just one, I'll go through this quickly because I know I'm belaboring the point here, but we just have a lot of misconception from students about this. So again, if we look at something like HCl, which we've seen a number of times now, the polar covalent bond. Now the bond, this polar covalent bond would require 431 kilojoules per mole to break that bond. And don't even worry about kilojoules per mole as a unit, but 431 versus to overcome this intermolecular force, it's only 16 kilojoules per mole. And so obviously it's much easier to break apart the intermolecular forces than the um, intramolecular bonds. And again, this is important. So I'm gonna give you one more analogy here, which is kind of weird. Um, and so I apologize in advance. Uh, 
And I don't know what it says about me that in terms of an analogy, this is where my brain goes. But if you think about the game Red Rover, and I don't even know if you can play this anymore because I just feel like it's asking for broken limbs at this point. But if you think about inter versus intra molecular forces, inter molecular forces are broken when someone runs through you holding the hand of the person next to you. So that would be an intermolecular force, you holding the hand, because it's you, you know, as a molecule versus that person as a molecule. And then when that's broken, that's like breaking the intermolecular force. That is much easier to do than let's say, bear with me here, ripping the arm off of someone. That is breaking an intramolecular force. And again, I apologize, but an intramolecular force holds molecules together. And so um, it is much easier to break through someone holding hands with someone next to them than it would be to actually um, rip someone's arm off, which would be breaking an intramolecular force. Like I said, that, that's the best analogy I could come up with, and actually I think it works. Um, just don't think about it too much. All right, there are three types of intermolecular forces that you're responsible for. And so we're going to go through them. And the first, and there's actually a kind of some quasi other ones, but we're just going to focus on these three. So dipole, dipole. We talked about dipole, we defined it earlier. And so this relates directly to that first section of these notes. And so as we talk about dipole, dipole intermolecular forces, again, we're talking about between. So you know there's gonna be a polar covalent bond that's holding this together. We're not talking about breaking that. We're talking about that in general. Um, we are actually talking about the uh, interaction between these two molecules. And so we talk about a permanent dipole. And what I mean by that is chlorine is more electronegative. And because chlorine is more electronegative, always, that doesn't change. All of a sudden, hydrogen can't become more electronegative. Chlorine is more electronegative. And so we will always have a slight negative region, as you can see here, forming on chlorine because it is hogging the electrons. And we'll have a slight positive region on hydrogen. That always is permanent. That doesn't change. And so this leads to what we call a dipole-dipole force or a dipole-dipole interaction between these molecules. And so again, right here, you're seeing this right here represents the intermolecular force. So there's an attraction between the negative and positive here, and these are gonna interact. And so HCl is hydrochloric acid, and that remains a liquid at you know, most temperatures you would find on Earth. And that is because of these intermolecular forces. Um, it's, it, you have to overcome these intermolecular forces in order to have hydrochloric acid become a vapor. And um, it takes a lot of energy to, to do that. Something else to kind of think about is if I were to bring another hydrochloric acid molecule in, notice that this is negative and negative, right? Because of the electron electronegativity and same with the hydrogen here. And so if now you can kind of picture because of the geometry work we did last week, this is in, in 3D, and so it's gonna flip around and orient itself that way. And again, then you would get your interactions in terms of the dipole-dipole interaction here between positive, negative, and here, and here. And so again, a lot of this leads to your um, intermolecular forces, and you have to overcome those in order to go from solid to liquid to gas. And again, you can draw arrows, and if that helps to map out things, great, but you're not required to draw those arrows, but I think it helps. Now, we'll talk about hydrogen bonding, and, and from the start here, because I've given you a little bit more down here than really, really you need, um, when you hear hydrogen bonding, think water. There are other types of hydrogen bonds, and not types, but there's other hydrogen bonds besides water, and I will show you one later in the third part of this lecture. Um, which I know you're really excited about already. But for now, just to, again, to keep things simple, think water. And so this is a specific type of dipole-dipole, and that's important. And so we talked just talked about dipole-dipole. Permanent dipoles existing because of a difference in electronegativity. Hydrogen bonding is a very specific and strong version of dipole-dipole. And so water, as I mentioned, is the one that I want you to know, um, because this really just tells us there's a lot of real-world applications here. So we know that water is going to involve both a uh, polar covalent here and here between oxygen and hydrogen. And that means there's a slight negative region forming here and slight positive regions here. So if I were to take a group of water, like three, but if we just look at these three, 
remembering that there's there's dipoles and so negative and positive you're going to have attractions happening here and so negative positive negative positive negative positive and and each of these right here and here and here would be your hydrogen bond now the, the term isn't great this is not a bond this is not ionic or covalent it's not as strong as those we've talked about that a lot i think red rover but um this is enough to give water some really important properties um, and down here you can see i've added a little bit more to this definition and again um i, I kept this in just just for your own reference but you're not going to be tested on this technically it's uh, a hydrogen bonds between hydrogen and then these three remember i said for hydrogen bonding just think water and uh, so there's a couple of things first of all if we think about two water molecules here Remember that hydrogen is slightly positive and oxygen is slightly negative. And so when we bring these towards each other, we're going to rotate and flip. And so that here's your hydrogen bond. But what this means is, is an interesting property of water due to hydrogen bonding is that ice, so solid um, H2O, is less dense than liquid. And so we know ice floats. But that's somewhat of a unique property. And it has to do with the hydrogen bonds allow water to form very specific structures. So as we remove energy from water, it starts to form these very specific hydrogen bonds. And because it starts to actually get a little bit um, less dense and, and take up more volume because of that, water as a solid floats and water as a liquid, ice floats in water. And I know it's like, we all know this, but think about life at the bottom of fresh water, right? If ice just, um, you know, went down to the bottom because it was more dense than liquid version of water, it would crush everything below it and we wouldn't have life surviving during cold months or life even forming in the first place if we, when we talk about, you know, um, life likely having began in water. And so that's an important aspect of it. Um, we can also talk about in order to, and we mentioned this before, but in order for water to boil from liquid then to gas, you've got to break these hydrogen bonds. And so what ends up happening is water has a pretty high boiling point compared to a lot of liquids. Um, if you've ever gotten something like nail polish on you, um, you know, when you're using it, it feels like it's cold as it starts to evaporate. And that's because it has a very low um, boiling point um, compared to something like water. And so it's going to evaporate very quickly. And um, water does not do the same thing. And so again, think about how important fresh water is on Earth. If water had a lower um, boiling point, then all of a sudden we get water becoming vapor very quickly and fresh water doesn't exist, right? All the oceans are just constantly, it'd be constantly raining and then becoming vapor and um, we don't have fresh water really on earth. So that's important. Um, for anyone who's ever done a belly flop, you have experienced hydrogen bonding as well. And so again, if you were to jump into something that was not a polar molecule and exhibit hydrogen bonding like water, um, you would uh, not, it wouldn't hurt as much. You wouldn't be overcoming the hydrogen bonds. And then you also get something like surface tension here. And so the idea is that for this water strider, it's able to stay on the surface. Now, again, it's, it's got a large surface area here and that helps, but there's hydrogen bonds all over right here on the surface. And that leads to surface tension. And the water strider obviously does not have a lot of mass. And so the ability of that to stay on top of the water is because of those hydrogen bonds on the surface. Um, it's not massive enough to overcome those hydrogen bonds. And then finally, something like surface tension creates cool pictures like this. So a lot of really important properties of water that lead to life as we know it, all coming from the fact that water is polar and exhibits hydrogen bonds as its intermolecular force. All right, the third one and final is something called London dispersion forces. And it is important to point out here that this involves an instantaneous dipole. So permanent dipoles were something like polar covalent. And we saw that before, um, but the permanent ones are polar covalent. That's due to electronegativity differences. And again, the electronegativity doesn't change. Um, when you look at your appendix here, you don't need a different appendix depending on certain things for those electronegativity values. They always exist. That's permanent. Um, and so instead, when we talk about a London dispersion force, that's not involving polar bonds. It's involving just covalent bonds. So here's my example. We've got H2 here. And so when you think about hydrogen 
in a bond. It's just a single covalent bond. Remember, it's an exception. It only needs two. And because it's both hydrogens, there's no difference in electronegativity, we would assume that those electrons are equally being shared somewhere in between the two hydrogen. So again, we could look at a situation like this. Is that a probable way for the electrons to reside in that bond? Yeah. Impossible? Absolutely. What about something like this? A little further apart, but is it probable? Yes, it's still being shared in the middle. Impossible? Yes. We could do something like that. Probable? Yeah. And both possible. But then we could all of a sudden end up with something like this, where both electrons from this bond, and again, bonds aren't a single line here, but um, the bond in between here, they both happen to reside on that side. Now, is that probable? No. But is it possible? Yes. For a split second, randomly, both electrons might reside on this side. And what have we now created? A dipole. Now it's instantaneous, it only exists for a moment, but because just momentarily both electrons are on this side of this bond, we've created a polar bond, even though usually, because hydrogen's uh, electronegativity difference are the same, it's the same atom, usually there's no difference, but just randomly. So it's instantaneous because it's gonna go away, right? But we also say, in terms of our London dispersion force, that we can induce dipoles. So here's what I mean by that. If we happen to have another hydrogen molecule here, and notice that these electrons are being shared equally, but let's say just randomly over here, we get this induced uh, dipole, this instantaneous dipole. We can induce a dipole on this one. And because we know that the same, same charges repel, notice that now I've induced a negative, slight negative region here and slight positive region here. And again, it's simply because of just an instantaneous moment where that dipole happens to exist. And so if we were to look at a group of hydrogen molecules and we get a sudden instantaneous dipole in this one, we can notice that that's going to travel through this group. Now, because these are instantaneous, they are weak. There's still an intermolecular force and actually there's some, uh, I think things that you probably don't even think about would be instantaneous and weak. For example, scotch tape and adhesives in general operate on London dispersion forces. And I will talk about that more in the, the third part of this lecture. But, um, you know, I mean, even though those are weak, this is certainly an important part of our everyday life. And so London dispersion forces, despite being weak, and they are the weakest, um, are an important part. They're an important molecular force. So one last thing, all molecules exhibit some amount of London dispersion forces because just by chance you could end up with the electrons existing. We talked about electrons existing like this. They might exist on one side of even a, a just nonpolar covalent bond. They might exist on one side. You have an instantaneous dipole, which then can be induced in others. And so this becomes, you know, an actually a pretty important intermolecular force, even though it may be the weakest. Okay, I think you deserve another break here. Again, maybe let's not uh, take a break for the entire year. Take a few minutes, um, you can pause. Um, if you want to look ahead to the uh, assignment, the other remote assignment this, this week, you actually probably have enough to, to think about that. And so you could take a break from notes and go to that, but just come back for just a quick third section of these notes. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so hopefully you weren't too weirded out by the Red Rover thing. You're back. It's great. Um, also, I should apologize. Um, I have a couple more Lamborghinis being delivered today, and I don't know when they might get loud in the back. Um, I just want a couple more to kind of like, I like to match my shirt and tie to the color of the car. And so I ordered a few more today. So uh, I'm not sure when that's being delivered. But anyway, let's get back into it. This last section is pretty short. It's just a couple of practice problems, ultimately, to put everything together from the last three weeks. And again, I know there's a, a long set of notes here. And so I'm trying to give you a few chemistry cat jokes. Dispersion, get in, okay. All right, so um, real quick, I, I kind of mentioned it, but I want to make sure that we're on the same page here. So in terms of the intermolecular forces, and again, intramolecular forces, the Red Rover thing, um, the bonds themselves are, are stronger. But if we look just at the intermolecular forces between molecules, hydrogen bonding is the strongest. Now, that is a form of dipole-dipole. But because it is stronger and water is what you need to know about that. Um, just hydrogen bonding, think water, even though there's some others. 
but it's such an important part of life as we know it that we, we kind of have it separated out. And so that is my point here, that both of these involve uh, dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonding involve polar molecules and polar bonds. Um, but hydrogen bonds is a special version of that, whereas non dispersion forces are nonpolar molecules. So remember, that is that instantaneous dipole that just randomly it pops up, whereas these polar molecules here, that's just a permanent dipole, right? The electronegativity difference always exists. And as one last reminder here, they are all weaker than the actual bonds holding them together. Red rover. Okay. And so real quick, application. So you're actually doing this, whether you've looked at the second um, remote assignment this week or not, you will be doing just one application of intermolecular forces, but I thought it's worth just bringing up a couple, um, just because this is one of the more applicable things that will teach you these intermolecular forces. So I mentioned it earlier, but just an example, tape. Tape works because of intermolecular forces. And so if you kind of look at this uh, graphic here, um, what, the surface of whatever you're trying to, um, you know, put adhesive on, if you were to zoom in, you know, microscopically, there's a lot of, you know, pits and valleys here. And so at each of these red dots, there's an intermolecular force. But as you push tape down, you're creating even more and more intermolecular forces. And those intermolecular forces are ultimately what holds tape to things. And so, you know, when you think about it, you tape something up on the wall, it's just intermolecular forces. And even though they're not as strong as the bonds that hold things together, um, those intermolecular forces can, can obviously have a pretty big impact. Something like soap works based on intermolecular forces. And so we're, we're including some things from biology, which I assumed you remember hydrophobic and, and hydrophilic uh, interactions, but the, that also ultimately has to do with polar and nonpolar. And so you can see here, if we have dirt on your skin, um, we can uh, organize the soap molecules based on polar nonpolar interactions, and they can ultimately get the uh, dirt and whatever the green and red things are uh, off of your skin. And so um, soap works based on intermolecular forces and polarity of molecules. And even more applicable right now would be that viruses um, can be destroyed based on polar nonpolar interactions. And so um, COVID in particular, uh, not all viruses have this, but COVID has a lipid uh, protection, so it has a, a lipid layer around it, but that lipid layer can be um, destroyed and broken up by either soap, so obviously washing your hands is important, but also the alcohol that is found in uh, hand sanitizer. And so um, hand sanitizer to be effective needs to be, I think, 70% or more alcohol, but both alcohol and soap have polar nonpolar regions, and those polar nonpolar regions can disrupt these layers right here, as you can see in some of these graphics. And that is what uh, allows the virus to be destroyed ultimately is by exposing the inner RNA. And so again, all of this is applicable and intermolecular forces are, are really one of the more um, applicable real world things that we'll talk about. All right, so then let's just do a couple of examples here. All right, so I'm going to put the last three weeks together into this practice, and you can expect with the exam that we're going to ask you to put these three things together. So Lewis structure, geometry, and now intermolecular forces. And you have seen some of these before, like we, you've seen formaldehyde CH2O, um, but now we're going to put it all together. And so you've done Lewis structure. I know that from the worksheet. And so here it is. So we have the Lewis structure here. Here's our central atom of carbon. And so hopefully you can get to Lewis structure. The next step would be the geometry. And so we look at our central atom. I've got, of the four domains, I've got three bonding and zero lone pair. So that gives us something like this. It's the trigonal planar. And again, those 120 degree bonding angles. And you don't need to know the bonding angles, but just realize this is planar within the same plane. And this maximizes the distance between electrons, which is what Vesper model is all about. Now, if we look at this Lewis structure, you realize that this is, we need to look for lone pairs in the central atom. We don't have any, but we can also look at symmetry. 
and hydrogen hydrogen versus oxygen is not symmetrical. And you'll realize too that um, oxygen, well, let's start here, carbon is more electronegative. And then oxygen is more electronegative. And so overall, this is an uneven tug of war. And ultimately, then you get this overall negative versus positive region on this molecule, which makes it polar. So with that in mind, oxygen and hydrogen and carbon, their electronegativities don't change. And so this is dipole, it's permanent, and this is dipole, dipole as your intermolecular force. Next example, methane, which we have seen multiple times, so Lewis structure is pretty straightforward at this point. And again, in terms of geometry, you have four, again, four domains possible, at least in first year chemistry, all filled with bonds. And so this would give you a tetrahedral geometry. And again, don't worry too much about the bond angles, but we're just maximizing. If you can picture this in 3D, and remember you would draw me a wedge here, a nice little dotted line there. But you're, if you think about this in 3D, that would be the bond angle. Now, if we go back to then intermolecular forces, if you look at this molecule, and we dealt with it earlier and we talked about it, but it's gonna be symmetrical. There's no lone pairs and it's symmetrical. And um, so ultimately, these are going to be covalent bonds. I know it's just on the cusp at 0.4, but these are covalent bonds. There's no overall polarity to these bonds or polarity to the molecule. Uh, but remember, no matter what, as we mentioned in the previous section, London dispersion forces are always present. So if hydrogen bonding is not involved, if dipole dipole is not involved, London dispersion is involved. And so, yes, nonpolar overall as a molecule. But remember that Lund dispersion forces, if there's no other polarity happening and there's no, no other intermolecular forces uh, occurring, it's Lund dispersion. Let's look at ammonia real quick. And again, we've seen this one before. And so lone pair obviously is gonna dictate both geometry and intermolecular force. So as you look, we have three bonds and one lone pair that gives us the trigonal pair middle with again the lone pair on top here and then all of these bonds get pushed down and again don't worry too much about the bond angles we are maximizing the distance between the electrons residing in bonds and so this is a permanent dipole right nitrogen's electronegativity does not change neither does hydrogen's and again when you think about in terms of the electrons they are all going in this direction within these bonds Nitrogen is unequally sharing these, and so we have a slight negative region up here. This is a polar molecule, and this gives us a dipole-dipole. As I mentioned, water is the hydrogen bonding example that you need to know. This is technically hydrogen bonding. I want you just to know dipole-dipole, and that's enough for us right now. All right, one more example. So carbon dioxide, we've seen a lot. So when we think about the actual uh, geometry of it, you notice there's two bonds, no lone pairs, and so that's going to give us the linear geometry, 180 degree bond between to get these as um, far away from each other as possible. But then when we start thinking about the polarity of this, so we're kind of think, you know, split down the middle here. Carbon and oxygen is a polar bond. Um, oxygen is more electronegative, and so it is going to kind of pull the electrons towards it, but so is this one. And so when you think again of a tug of war where there's completely equal pull of electrons this direction, completely equal pull in the opposite direction, equal and opposite, we're gonna end up with an overall nonpolar molecule. So again, as we're saying down here, the carbon uh, oxygen bond is polar, but because of the way the molecule is linear, it is nonpolar overall. And so we have no overall dipole, and this ends up giving us London dispersion forces. So again, every molecule has London dispersion. And again, it's important to point out that these bonds are polar, but the molecule is not. And so even a nonpolar molecule can still exhibit some London dispersion forces. Again, the idea is that could all of the, could the electrons, um, even though there's kind of equal and opposite, could the electrons all of a sudden reside uh, in one place, could they all reside closer over to, to this oxygen and give a slight negative and slight positive instantaneous? Yes. 
And if that happens, it's an instantaneous dipole and we get long dispersion courses. All right, so thank you for listening through that. I know that was a bit of a long lecture. Hopefully you took some brain breaks, um, but that concludes the uh, material for unit two. And so hopefully this stuff is somewhat fresh, but remember, you gotta know Lewis structure, you gotta know geometry to get to intermolecular forces. So please let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Um, otherwise, until next time.